गुड आफ्टरनून सर वेरी गुड आफ्टरनून डॉक्टर कही थैंक यू सर हाउ आर यू सर फाइन 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 सर फाइन सो द पीपल स्टार्ट जॉइनिंग अराउंड एट 3 सो दे माइट गेट कंफ्यूज्ड या या
College of Veterinary and Animal Science. 15 Golden Years of Glittering Services. Natu aham kame rajam, na swargam na punar bhavam, kame dukhatapta nam, prani nam arti nashanam. Neither desire to rule a kingdom, nor an abode in the heaven, or emancipation. My only desire is that. I am able to remove the sorrows and pain of all suffering living beings on this earth. So also true for the basic tenet of medicine to realize the potential to bring all human beings, animals and living creatures out of pain, grief and suffering. Thus, College of Veterinary and Animal Sciences Parbhani feels happy and contented to deliver its selfless services for the same cause. Veterinary College Parbhani was established in the year 1972 as a constituent college of Maratwada Agricultural University Parbhani in order to cater the needs of people from Maratwada region of the state consequent upon the formation of a separate university for veterinary science and animal husbandry in the year 2000 2001 college is working under Maharashtra Animal and Fishery Sciences University Mapsu Nagpur The jurisdiction of this college is spread over four districts of Maratwada region in Maharashtra state. The institute represents the rural part of Maratwada inclusive of small dairies, farmers with small to medium holdings of dairy cattle and buffaloes, poultry, sheep and goats on one hand and on the other the developed part of Aurangabad as its commercial hub. It is therefore the college has a great deal of potential. for veterinary education research and extension work the institute imparts education in veterinary science and animal husbandry through the intake of 80 students every year for undergraduate course three students per department for post graduation and phd programs in four departments of the institute the alma mater continually works in the field of research teaching and extension research is being conducted at well equipped laboratory facilities teaching with modernized audio visual classrooms and on farm and online modality are devised and developed for outreach and advisory services the library has an academic ambience and is a treasure of textbooks reference books journals reference and digital repository students are availed with good hostel facility Gokul Jain's Hostel and Vrindavan as ladies hostel with well equipped gym khana and recreation hall the institute has a well organized livestock research demonstration and training center consisting of livestock and agricultural farms with adequate livestock and irrigation facilities farmers are regularly visiting the college for sorting out their queries on scientific animal husbandry practices Red Kandhari Research Institute is specially established and functioning towards conservation and research on popular local cattle breed Lal Kandhari. Fodder cafeteria is designed with cultivation of fodder crops catering the fodder requirements of animals. Marathwadi buffaloes, Usmanabadi goats, Deccani sheep and poultry are also reared at farm in a scientific manner. Students are provided with adequate hands-on practice under the supervision of expert faculty members at the teaching veterinary clinical complex more and more exposure is given to students through clinical camps and ambulatory services the institute has also successfully implemented dbt dst icr central government and state government funded projects hello this is the administrative support of my university mapsu faculty of this institute have regularly contributed much in extension activities they have pursued innovative extension methods to approach farmers and animal breeders number of national and international seminars webinars conferences workshops we have conducted 
with their constant support. And this activity has given credit to this particular institute. Dr. Tameen, we can start the session. Yes, yeah, yes, sir, yes. So, a warm welcome to all of the participants and especially our expert today, first expert, Dr. V. R. Kasrali Karsar, in this three days online training program for Bowen Mastite's current concepts therapeutics and management. So it is a day a third of this training program. And for this, the first lecture will be by Dr. Vivek R. Kasrali Karsar, Professor and Head Department of Veterinary Clinical Complex, Veterinary College, Vidar, Karnataka. So sir has a vast experience consisting of 30 years as sir has joined us as, as assistant professor in 1988. Sir is currently acting as professor and head department of veterinary clinical complex, veterinary college, be there. Sir, to his credit, has a lot of research in shape of uh, national and international research papers, book chapters, abstracts in the conferences, popular articles and has been awarded with several national and at various national and international conferences. Sir has guided 10 MBS students and one PhD student and more than 30 students have been under minor advisory under, under his committee. So sir has also be acted as co-principal investigator in ICR sponsored NATF, NATP project on weather based animal disease forecast. And sir has also acted as principal investigator in two university funded and two extramural funded projects. And also has acted as co-principal investigator in more than five universities funded projects. And also chorus director for four KVC sponsored trainings and also ASCAD trainings. So sir has a vast profile and, and is also expert on this topic that is going on from last two days that is bovine mastitis. So it is our great opportunity to learn a few things from the sir. So most welcome sir, you can continue sir. Am I audible, Dr. Shafi? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Continue. So, shall we start? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Please, sir. Am I audible? Yes, sir. You correct? Am I audible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. You are audible, sir. Please share your sir, screen. I have already shared. It's not visible. Yes, yes. It is coming, sir. Yeah. Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. You can continue, sir. Please. Shall I go in presentation mode? One yes, sir. Minute. Yes, sir. Please go ahead. Good afternoon, everybody. Today, we are going to talk on a very important clinical condition affecting the 
udder and teats, especially in buffaloes. The other day, Dr. Shafi and Dr. Borikar, they called me and uh, they told me that they are going to organize a three-day training for the benefit of working veterinarians on mastitis and any topic which is of interest if I am able, uh, I'm ready to share during the training. So I thought many people, you know, already four speakers have spoken for two days on different aspects, different aspects of uh, mastitis. I thought, let me give emphasis to this topic, allergic mammitis in buffaloes, and which is a very much you know, prevalent when we go slide by slide, we will understand what it is and how important it is. Now, my first question to all the participants over here is how many of you, you have encountered this problem in buffaloes? And I'm sure 95% of the participants will say that at one or the other occasion, they have seen such kind of you know, clinical condition, which normally we suspect that it is a mastitis, okay? We will differentiate, we will go in detail into this uh, disorder, and I will tell you how it differs from mastitis. And yeah. it is a very difficult clinical condition to treat because the enormous enlargement of the teeth makes it almost impossible to draw the milk. In spite of, you know, many people try to squeeze the affected teeth, swollen teeth, but it didn't, it does not yield any amount of milk. Okay? So much of swelling is there that it will yes. obstruct the lactating canal. Great, sir. Hello. Kindly make the screen full screen. And uh, just for your information, the topic has been uh, started yesterday. Many people have expressed that it's a concern of buffaloes and we have requested them that. Yeah, but uh, Dr. Nitin, you are, you are interacting? Yes, sir. Yeah. I am somehow I am clicking on that, mm -hmm. but it is not going in a presentation mode. That is what I am finding it difficult. Okay, so kindly, sir, unshare and then reshare. One minute. Huh? One minute. Huh? Yes, sir. Resume, yeah, yeah. Is it okay? Yeah, sir. Is it visible? Yes, yeah, sir. Huh? Shall we go yeah. to the next slide? Yeah. Yes, yes, sir. yes. So this is a very a typical type of condition which is encountered in you can say ninety nine point nine percent in buffaloes. Very rarely it can also be seen in uh, lactating cows also, but it is of concern in buffaloes, and it has been named. You know, the, we will go through the history and then development of uh, different aspects of this disease in uh, forthcoming slides. But let me tell you, this condition we have to differentiate that it is not mastitis. And why I will also justify my point of view, why we should consider it as an allergic mammitis rather than um, mastitis as such. Now you see here, the genesis of name. In this slide, I wanted to just enumerate what has happened over a period of time. In 1963, in Scotland, Dr. Martin and his team, they have recorded a very unusual type of lesions on the udder and teats of the dairy cows, lactating cows. And because these lesions, they used to coalesce and then it, they used to further, you know, develop into ulcer, and then so many other complications were there. So actually, Dr. Martin and his team in 1963, they termed it as bovine ulcerative mammalitis. And if you, if you go through the literature till this date also, there are several reports telling that it is bovine ulcerative mammalitis. I don't want to contradict on this issue. It may be there, bovine ulcerative mastitis, but this is slightly different what we are encountering in India. So that's why I just wanted to emphasize. Actually, in 1968, Pravin Mamo and Derbyshire and Hague in 1969, they continued to work on this bovine ulcerative mammalitis-like condition in dairy cows, and they named it as skin gangrene. 
of bovine udder skin gangrene of bovine udder and they were the one which who pointed out that probably a virus is associated with and since then bovine herpes virus is always linked to this bovine ulcerative mammalitis condition in dairy cows okay then we'll come to the indian scenario what has happened in india so maybe there may not be there the incidence of the disease whether was there or not but what happened was lot of buffalo husbandry uh, activities they were initiated in coastal andhra pradesh especially in the krishna and godavari uh, delta region adjoining to the sea okay because lot of paddy was there the, the environment was very congenial government also sponsored the buffalo breeding and buffalo husbandry so that's why buffalo population has tremendously increased in uh, these uh, east and west godavari districts of andhra pradesh and in 1970 onwards you know few veterinarians they keep on you know they kept on reporting that a very unusual condition is being recorded in these buffaloes okay and the credit of naming this condition as allergic mammitis goes to shankaram and kottaya in 1979 through a published public published scientific uh, published paper in indian veterinary journal okay so they enumerated what happens in that and uh, uh, how the disease progresses and all now in that uh, particular article shankaram and kottaya they you know they insisted that the condition should be named as allergic mammitis because what why why it should be normally you all of us we are professionals we are professional doctors we know that allergy has got a sudden onset except you know type 3 type 4 allergy delayed hypersensitivity reaction they come late but most of time anaphylaxis anaphylaxis then skin reaction urticaria they are sudden they suddenly appear on the animal so that's why they said that the disease condition is very very sudden without giving any premonitory sign you know they used to say even in some of the i, I had done my doctoral studies in uh, andhra pradesh and along with me so many other mbsc and phd students were there and i used to interact and try to collect the information on this condition they used to say it is very very strange sir a buffalo which goes for grazing and in about 2 hours it comes back with a huge swelling where the teat cannot be hold in hands that much of enormous swelling of the teat takes place okay sudden onset of swelling that's why they say that the shankaram and kotaya they insisted that the condition looks to be allergic okay then no response response to mastitis treatment this is very strange they were telling you know mastitis is known to all the veterinarians since uh, ages together and we know how to treat mastitis okay parenteral antibiotic we give anti inflammatory give we try to apply some of the you know gels which will act as a inflammatory anti inflammatory agent they will try to reduce the swelling and in severe conditions also we inject intramammary intramammary infusions containing antibiotics and so many other stuff isn't it so this is how you treat and in 90% of the mastitis cases the case response may be in 2 days maybe in 3 days maybe in about 4 or 5 days but they say that in spite of doing all you know possible measures for mastitis these cases they do not respond to treatment and the condition keeps on worsening and at the end they find that the complications like ulceration takes place necrosis at the base of the teat gangrene and in many cases the teat gets sloughed off okay this is the situation in allergic mammitis so way back in 1977 we should be thankful to these two people who have you know first identified and reported scientific our our problem in india is we do so much of work but unfortunately we fail to document it and that's why we do not get a credit of it so this shankaram and kotai in 1977 they first named it as allergic mammitis condition and i narrated you what are the possible reasons they suspected that it could be allergic and that's why they call it as allergic mammitis then sri ramulu he is a postgraduate student who did his i think um, postgraduate research in department of medicine in uh, tirupati veterinary college from 90 to 93 he also worked on this condition and then he reiterated it means he also said that the term to, for this condition should not be mastitis but it should be allergic mammitis what are the reasons the reasons the foremost reason what he has quoted is milk did not yield any bacterial growth and culture this is very very surprising 
all mastitis we know mastitis bacteria we know the primary environment environmental pathogens are there then opportunities pathogens are there staphylococcus are there strepto are there coli e coli is there so many bacteria they are involved isn't it and we know the classification also and last two days probably many people must have talked on the etiological aspects of mastitis okay this is surprising okay sri ramuli he worked for 2 to 3 years on this condition and no milk sample uh, yielded any bacterial growth on culture isn't it so it is not infection it is something else right and what he suggested what he tried you know apart from trying all those antibiotic this that and all he tried anti antihistamines and steroids and about 60 to 70% of the cases they used to respond to this treatment steroids and antihistamines and that's why the belief got much more stronger that it is not a infection it is only a allergic reaction which has yielded which has resulted into inflammation then the credit also should go to sundaresh and Jan janaki sundaresh in 1997 they published a report in indian veterinary journal uh, indian veterinary journal and they enumerated sequence of events what happens how it originates what happens in untreated cases what happens after the use of steroids and uh, anti stems how the case responds okay and the overall prevalence uh, all these reports they say that about 1.5 percent. please don't look at this low percentage of prevalence i will i am coming to the other aspects of the disease why it is important because it can end up into sloughing of the teeth and the whole gland get destroyed a good High yielding milking animal, it becomes unproductive within a, within a span of six or seven days. Okay, that is the importance of this allergic mastitis. Okay, now what are the schools of thought? Okay, one aspect we have seen that in uh, Western culture they say that probably bovine herpes virus is associated, and that's why they renamed it as bovine herpes uh, bovine uh, ulcerative mammalitis. Then some people, they say skin gangrene of bovine other. Then like that, they, they, there are so many theories are there. But un, and in Indian context, so many people have worked. Uh, even Dr. Chaudhary also has assigned. He was the professor for a very long period in Tirupati Veterinary College. He also uh, made some of the MBC students, PhD students uh, to work on this aspect. Dr. Hamza, Amir Hamza, he, is also, he was also head of the department of uh, Department of Medicine at uh, Rajendranagar Veterinary College. He also uh, published so many reports and his PhD work, part of it, uh, PhD work was on allergic mandates. Okay, so there is a strong conviction, conviction that there is some allergen which is playing a role. But unfortunately, we are not able to pinpoint it. What is that allergen? Okay, but the schools of thought, thought they say that like this. Why we should suspect that it is allergy? Because the lesions are restricted to teeth only. If you carefully look at the lesion, only teeth are affected. The gland is not at all affected. Whereas in mastitis, the gland is affected. In few cases, even the inflammation may extend to the teeth, isn't it? But the gland, prioritarily, what we say in mastitis, in students, I, even in working in clinic, I, I just ask them to touch the mastitis adder. Okay. Why we ask them to touch the adder? Because we want to know whether the adder is hot or cold to touch. Hot touch indicates acute mastitis. Cold touch indicates chronic mastitis. Simple, isn't it? So the inflammation of gland is very, very important. Acini, milk acini get affected. Okay. So the gland is more important in mastitis. And unfortunately, in this allergic mammitis, the gland is normal. The only problem is with teeth. Okay. The only problem with teeth. The inflammatory reaction is restricted to the teeth. No apparent swelling of inflammation of the gland, no bacterial growth and culture, in spite of repeated culture, primary culture, secondary culture, tertiary culture, you don't yield, the, the sample doesn't yield any bacterial growth. Okay, that says that the no organism is in, involved in that. Then some, some people may contradict, no, no, it may be virus also. Okay, we'll come to that point also. Okay, we don't have right now so much of uh, support. Uh, at field level, but at college level, people have worked on that and they try to cultivate the, uh, the milk to yield the virus. Many or many people, they have failed it. The virus also, they could not isolate from the uh, such affected cases. 
okay and i will tell you because i have, i have worked very at length on this topic so we will come on that then, then there is no change in quality of milk this is very surprising okay what we say what we ask to the owner when you squeeze the teat what kind of milk you feel he will 110% i am sure all of you agree that he will tell that there is a change in color the color the milk is not white it is yellowish it may reddish or it may be something else then the clots are there thick clots are there curdled milk is there isn't it so these changes they are associated and that's why we define also the physico chemical change in milk and the gland is called as mastitis in allergic mammitis surprisingly you do not find any change in the quality of milk but unfortunately the milk is not coming out it is retained and why it is retained it is retained because of the constriction the inflammation is so much that it compresses the teat canal and because of that you do not find the milk coming out coming out of the gland okay then teat canal obstruction i to again i will let it it is because of the enormous swelling and the incidence is very very high in primary varicose anemia this is very very important to suspect that probably it is a allergen okay primary varicose 95 to 96% of the allergic mammitis cases they are primary varicose they are experiencing lactation for first time in their life and that's why when i uh, we used to discuss with dr choudhury and dr hamza they used to tell us and i also suspected that probably in the later stage when the animal approaches the parturition the milk secretion starts isn't it so this milking milk protein probably may be allergic to some of the animals okay so this milk protein may be causing a some sort of allergic reaction to the adder and teat and that's why you find a typical uh, allergic type of reaction so that's why 95% of the cases when you when a allergic mammitis case present, presented to you by looking at the enormous swelling of the teat itself you can say it is allergic mammitis okay apart from that if you uh, ask the owner uh, owner will 100% say that sir this buffalo it is it was hyper and then recently it has become pregnant and then the animal is experiencing first lactation okay 60 to 75% of the cases they occur in first 10 days this is also very unusual okay mastitis can happen at any given point of time but these conditions they are very early immediately after parturition 60 to 75% so all of them they suggest that probably some allergen is there and uh, that is causing the allergic reaction and that's why the teats are reacting enormously to the inflammatory reaction and that's why they become very huge in scope okay let us come down to so uh, let me tell you i already told you that i did my post uh, doctoral studies at venkateshwar uh, 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 college of veterinary sciences tirupati i stayed there under the, uh, the blessings of uh, lord venkateshwara and i completed in 2000 uh, in the year 2000 so during my stay because my a topic was already decided i worked on uh, uh, lactic acidosis acute and per acute lactic acidosis in goats so my topic was decided so i made up my mind when i used to come across with so many veterinarians uh, during my study at tirupati they used to uh, you know talk so much about this allergic mammitis so i made up my mind when i come, i will come back to my parent institute uh, after my completion of phd i will also try to work on this topic and try to focus some more things uh, to understand what it is okay so that's why uh, dr samudra kulkarni he completed his post graduation in 2014 so he has worked under my guidance a uh, post graduate research on allergic mammitis okay so what we ha- we have observed hmm? i made him to make the study into two uh, formats one we call it as um retrospective study just to know uh, how the condition how much condition is common in and around the earth and then prospective study prospective study included identification of what is what are the reasons for this allergic mammitis and uh, uh, what is the uh, progression and how best you can treat it and that's what uh, that's what this whole postgraduate research uh, was uh, based on okay so i am giving the salient features of uh, his research which he did it under my guidance 
So the prevalence study was carried out for three years, 2010 to 2013. The overall prevalence of allergic mammitis was 3.292%. So this overall prevalence refers to all the buffaloes which were presented to hospital with different conditions. And out of those conditions, what is the prevalence of allergic mammitis? 3.9. Like let, let us come to the second point. Then we wanted to study how much its prevalence is there under, under other affections, affections. Okay, mastitis and related conditions are there. Under that, what is the contribution of allergic mammitis? And we were very much surprised to see that it contributes to 32.34, means one third of the cases of mastitis can be allergic mammitis. So it is a very serious condition and it needs to be focused, it needs to be understood well so that we can treat the, the cases at early stage because the case, case, once it becomes three or four days old, it is very, very difficult to reverse the changes. Okay, So that's why the early detection is the key for uh, treatment of allergic mammitis. Now, 80% incidence was recorded in Murra buffaloes. This is also very surprising. Of course, Murra buffaloes, whenever dairy farms are likely to be established, people they think that Murras, they are better fielders, they are well adapted than other uh, type of uh, buffalo breeds. So that's why probably Murra buffaloes, they are preferred as high uh, yielding, uh, milk yielding buffaloes. And that's why their population is also very high. So we could able to see that among all buffalo breeds, 80% of the affected buffaloes were of Murra breed. 84% in first lactation. Let me again underline this. And that's why I am telling you, it is primiparous. The condition is very, very common in primiparous. Uh, buffaloes, which are experiencing lactation for the first time. 74.5% uh, prevalence was in hide quarters than the fore quarters. Okay. And that everybody understands. Usually they say that the hind quarters, they get a little more milk yield than the uh, fore quarters. Uh, that is a physiological, uh, what you can call it, a setup in an animal. So because of that, because of that, uh, the affection is more commonly encountered in hind, hind teeth, maybe left hind teeth or right hind teeth, than commonly compared with the uh, anterior teeth or uh, four teeth, okay, four quarter teeth. Then 68.63% incidence or prevalence is in single teeth. Among all four teeth, you will see that the highest incidence is single teeth. But unfortunately, in few cases, even all the four teeth can be affected in one, uh, one animal, okay. But it is very rare. Normally, it is observed in only one single. Okay, 68.2. Majority of the cases, the affection is in uh, single. Thing. What are the clinical observations? What are the clinical observations? Clinical observations, again, we have already discussed in the earlier slide. There is no physical change in milk. Okay. So, by some means, may if you do the, what you can call it as cannulation into the um, uh, teeth canal, you may yield the milk and you will be surprised to see that the milk doesn't change its physical qualities. It is pure as it is, as though nothing is happening, but it is not coming out of the mammary gland and because of that the, the, we say that there is no physical change in milk and as a matter of fact, when you say it is mastitis, change in physical structure of milk is the first characteristic of mastitis, which doesn't happen. Then we tried to do the electrical conductivity test, then other uh, mastitis tests like white side tests. All of them, they are negative. There is no change in electrical conductivity. There is sudden and enormous uh, enlargement of affected teeth. Negative white side test. Okay. Mastitis, the preliminary test, what we say to detect mastitis is any test, which can be white side test, which can be even California mastitis test. There are so many tests, pen side test, what we call it. And how do you say the case is suffering from mastitis? First, you look for the physical changes in the milk. Second, you subject it to the chemical test like white side test or California mastitis test. And in 99% of these cases, the milk reacts to the test and the relative changes you can see. In white side test, normally the uh, normal mastitis milk turns into a gel like condition, isn't it? And that's how we call it as mast acute mastitis. Sometimes it watery flakes and other things are seen. When we say it is a chronic mastitis. So, but mastitis milk 
in 99% of the cases, it reacts to these states and you find a reason. But in this case, allergic myomitis, there is no, the, the white side test, California mastitis test, they are negative. Electrical conductivity also doesn't change when the normal. pH also, there is no significant difference in the normal pH, normal milk and milk uh, re recovered from a case of allergic myomitis. 87.5% samples were negative for bacterial growth. That's what I was telling you. So the earlier documentation, they used to say that there was no bacterial growth on uh, culture and sensitivity. But here we tried to all the allergic mammitis cases, uh, milk was subjected for culture and sensitivity. So let me stress at this point, 87%, almost 90%, you can see, 90% of the samples they were negative for any bacterial growth. And that's why we say that probably there is no infectious agent is involved in this allergic mammitis. Okay. Then further, what are the additional laboratory tests we can, which we can do? If your laboratory is uh, very good, you can always depend on these tests also. You can go for differential cell count, but you don't find any significant change. But what we have recorded, eosinophilic count in such cases is very, very high. And all we are all professional veterans. We know that elevation of eosinophils indirectly says that it is allergic. So we have elevated as absolute eosinophilic count in all the affected buffaloes, and it was the, it was indicating that definitely there is an involvement of some allergy. Okay. So what we did, you know, we did some mi electron microscopic studies. Okay, the affected teeth sample uh, scrappings as well as sometimes in advanced cases, even sloughed of teeth also we have taken. And then sections were made and these sections were subjected for electron microscopic studies. What it yielded, the electron microscopic studies revealed that there is a presence of casein-like milk protein throughout the teeth section. And that's why we say that probably one or the other part, milk protein is associated with uh, this condition and maybe it is inducing a allergic reaction. And not only casein infiltration, there is eosinophilic, so many eosinophils are there in the uh, affected tree. In electron microscopic uh, studies have revealed that. Few part, viral particles were also, I am not denying, uh, hardly uh, out of 100, you can say that 15% of the cases we could able to get the viral like particles in the electronic uh, elect electron microscopic study. But let me tell you, no viral particle was identical to herpes virus to say that herpes virus was associated with this condition. And that's why I always differ on this point. Probably herpes virus, what we call it as ulcerative mammitis, is not related to allergic mammitis, which we are dealing in Indian scenario. Okay. And then we try to do the C-reactive protein also. C-reactive protein also sometimes it is. We have studied that and there is elevated levels of C-reactive protein, and that also was used to, uh, as add-on para laboratory investigation for allergic mammals. Now, therapeutic approach, what we do? Now, you see, infection, inflammation, everything is there, so there is no other choice. You have to give endotoxins. Okay, any antibiotic as a matter of fact, broad, broad spectrum antibiotic, just to avoid any other complications of the condition. So you have to follow a protocol of we followed here endofloxacin at the rate of 4 mg per kg body weight. About 3 to 5 days, we gave the antibiotic just to safeguard the condition. Okay? Antihistamine was the priority in our case, and it was given at a specified dose. Chlorpermabin mallet was given at a specified dose to all the animals for 5 consecutive days. Then isoflopredol, uh, uh, isoflopredol, uh, that was also given as a steroid. 0.5 milligram per kg body weight because we have a choice of steroids which you can choose. Why we chose isoflood? Because uh, many a times the uh, betamethasone, dexamethasone, prednisolone at all, they uh, directly uh, reduce the milk yield in high lactic inactivity. So just we wanted to have a change and because the isoflood was a uh, new uh, steroid marketed in the uh, uh, in veterinary practice, so we thought that let us give a uh, room for uh, trial of this. So we used isoflopredon at the rate of 0.5 mg per kg. Okay. If you have a choice, you don't want to use steroid, even you can go for 
Fluenix in Meglumin at 1 mg per kg per day. It is a very good anti inflammatory drug and it yields <coughs> good results in severe inflammatory reaction. And that's why it is a top number one anti inflammatory drug right now in, in the veterinary practice. Okay, Fluenix in Meglumin at 1 mg per kg body weight. Now, specific therapy. What we did in this case. So we said that, okay, we are trying antibiotic, we are trying antihistamine, we are trying uh, <clears throat> uh, steroid also, apparently, for about two to three days. Now, the if you look at the treatment of asthma in human beings, you will be surprised to know that many people, you know, who suffer with either asthma or chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, COPD-like syndrome, in such cases, uh, previously, for months together, they were kept on antihistamines, then the bronchodilators, and steroids also. Okay, but the concept has changed recently. If you meet a pulmonologist, he will say that directly acting steroid is much more effective than giving systemically or apparently. And that's how the aerosol sprays they have come into the market. And that can that made us to believe that let us try these aerosol sprays, and we chose. Uh, three uh, compounds, salbutamol, which is a routinely used uh, cheaper bronchodilator in the market, salbutamol aerosol spray, which uh, have uh, around 100 microgram in per meter dose. Then budanocide, dodocard spray, it comes in uh, two formulations, 100 microgram and 200 microgram. So we tried 100 microgram also, we tried 200 microgram also. And the one more group we included, so uh, salbutamol, it is a, a beta uh, adrenergic agonist. So a better beta adrenergic agonist, agonist was available in combination with budonocide. So this is a new um, budocard spray, photocard they call it as, photocard spray available in market, which uh, uh, the people say that it is much more better because antihistaminic as well as bronchodilator as well as steroid. So combination of this. So budonocide, 100 microgram and Formoterol, you made six, six microgram. So these are four aerospins, aeros, uh, aerosol sprays we use. And all of them, they are called as fixed dose aerosol sprays. And three actuals per tea. So that's why I brought uh, Dr. Nitin. Am I visible? My video is on? Yes, yes, sir. Please. Yeah, yes, sir, I yes. want to show. Yeah. I want to make a demo. So this is an aerosol spray. Okay. This is an aerosol spray. And how it should be spread to affected teeth. Sir, so if, you can the, unshare, if you can unshare the slide, you will come on the full screen. So it will be a better demo. How 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 to? Uh, Just uh, unshare the slide. But, uh, stop uh, sharing. No, stop share. Uh, then you will right? come on full screen. You can give a better demo. Yeah, you are already on full screen. Yeah. Now you see, this is the aerosol spray. Okay. This is the aerosol spray. How you have to hold it? There are two ways. You know, you can, you know, hold it in this way also, in this way also. This is more appropriate because the pressure which you apply to this spray is much more appropriate. Okay. So let us presume now this aerosol space, they called as fixed aerosol space because once you press it, it emits the requisite quantity of that particular uh, medication and it doesn't uh, overdose you. Okay. Unless and until you, uh, unless and until you press it second time. Okay, so once you press it, it will deliver only 100 micrograms. What I am telling you, first, what we have seen, salbutamol 100 microgram, then the budonocide 100 microgram, budonocide 200 microgram. Miss the pharmaceutical companies, they have designed this spray in such a way that once you press it, it will give, it will deliver a specific dose. Okay, so let, let us presume, let me show you. This is suppose, this is the teeth, this is the spray, you hold it like this, angle it towards the teeth and spray. That's all. One at a time. I just, for demo sake, I have pressed twice. So if you press once, it will deliver one. That's all. Okay. How you have to spray? On three sides. Okay. You can choose any. The lateral you can choose, the anterior you can choose, posterior you can choose. Okay. The medial, of course, the other teeth is there. Probably you do. You may not have any space over there. So choose lateral, anterior and posterior. Okay, so three actuals. Is it clear, Dr. Nathin? Nathin? Dr. Nathin, shall we go to the... Yes, sir, slide? yes, sir. 
Yes, sir. Sir, uh, share the screen again, sir. Okay. So now, did you understand? All of you, did you understand what I meant to say? Is and nowadays, just I was uh, reading this. Okay, they have given one window also over here. Okay, so maybe this this is solvable. That may be there in uh, uh, other uh, Bidona sites pray also. So every time you press, no, the one number will be pushed forward. So now I am seeing there it is reading five. This five sprays are already five doses have already been delivered. So like that, okay. So what you have to do is what you have to understand from this is three actuals per tick every twelve hours. Mind it, three actuals means three sprays, and which are the three sides? Preferably the lateral, anterior, and posterior. Three actuals per tick every twelve hours. Along with what we have discussed, a course of antibiotic for three to five days, a course of uh, antihistamine for five consecutive days, and a steroid, preferably isoflurane. We have used it and we have found it is quite effective. So that's why I am recommending isoflurane can also be uh, used effectively at 0.5 milligram per kg body weight, well, maybe three days. Don't give more than two to three days. Okay. And this spray, we will come to that which spray is better. So this spray. Three actuals every twelve hours for about four to five days. You will see a dramatic result in about twenty-four to forty-eight hours. Let me tell you. Okay, I have. I will share you some of the photographs also in few other uh, slides, and you will. You only will appreciate how the things have changed, and you also must have experienced. If you have treated such cases, you have to break your head to reduce the swelling of the feet, and in spite of doing. You know, let me tell you. In field, people they are very innovative. Our veterinary doctors, we should appreciate. They keep on trying, trying, trying one or the other method, and sometimes they get success. Andhra veterinarians, they tried so much. You let me tell you. So there, there are few papers are there which I, uh, I could not uh, drag it out. But people have used that a ring method. At the base of the teeth, people have used antihistamine, point one, point one, point one, point one, like that. Okay, and they got results also. Some people they have used even steroid also, as a, in the ring form. Okay, around the teeth base, they got results. Okay, but this I think is more scientific and acceptable method, where directly the dose containing the chemical or the drug comes in contact with the um, skin. Get absorbed and exerts the exact effect. Okay, so we tried this for salbutamol, 100 microgram salbutamol. We have tried in about six to seven buffaloes. Then budonocyte, 100 microgram, budonocyte, 200 microgram, and a combination of budonocyte and formoterol fumarate. Okay, so out of this, let us come down. So these are the uh, market preparations which are available. You can see aspirin is salbutamol, budocode 100. Is uh, 100 microgram. Budacort 200 is 200 microgram, and this foracort, foracort is budonocyte 100 microgram, and six micrograms of formoterol. So like that. So these four preparations we have used it, and let us go go to the results. Okay. So basically, let us uh, you know understand the pharmaco kind of pharmacology behind this mode of action now. Salbutamol and formoterol, they are beta 2 adrenergic uh, agonists, which act by so many means. And they are being widely used as bronchodilators, and human practice they form a very uh, respectable place, especially in the management of asthma. Okay, what actually it does? It inhibits the release of inflammatory mediators like histamine, leukotrienes, and phosphatidine. So it acts as anti-inflammatory agent. Okay, and apart from that, they are also known to increase superoxidase dismutase and glutathione peroxidase activity. So all of us we know that. the free radical injury it plays a very important role in inflammation so to avoid this free radical injury this uh, yes sod and gss activity uh, is required to reduce the inflammatory response so these products especially the salbutamol and formoterol they are known to increase the superoxide dismutase and glutathione peroxidase activity so thereby they help in reducing the inflammation 
they are also known to decrease myeloperoxidase activity and lipoperoxidase activity which is which activates the inflammation they are actually the tissue destructive type of enzymes and they come in the uh, as a defense mechanism to destroy the accumulated antigens but sometimes they damage to the surrounding tissues also so here it has been observed that this salvotamol and formotrol they also decrease the myeloperoxidase and lipoperoxidase activity thereby reducing the inflammatory damage to the uh, organ so that is what we expect in case of affected inflammatory inflammation in the teeth okay now what about the steroids budenoside budenoside is a uh, topical steroid it is 200 times it has got a higher affinity for glucocorticoid receptor than the traditional you can in, simply you can remember that it is 200 times more efficient than prednisolone which is routinely being, being used in the uh, field practice thousand times it has got a higher topical anti anti inflammatory action than cortisone thousand times and that's why it is it is having a therapeutic value especially in the management of asthma and we thought that let us try this also and we included 100 as well as 200 uh, microgram budenoside spray budocards what it does apart from this it inhibits degranulation of mast cells so the release of mast uh, histamine everybody knows that the mast cells they rupture and release the granules and thereby um, the histamine is released and then uh, so much of an inflammatory reaction is there inhibition of release of inflammatory mediators is also suppressed by this topical steroid like histamine eicosanides and cytokines okay so this is how the effect is exerted at the inflammatory reaction and that is what we are supposed to look at inflammate inflamed tissue and that is what we expect to do it to in a uh, very highly inflamed tissue uh, so that's why we get a very good response now coming to the results now you see here the two pictures are there hmm? this is the affected tissue on zero day this is the affect uh, the uh, effect of the uh, spray after five days you can see almost one third reduction in the inflammatory swelling which will not result by any anti inflammatory drug on this earth. let me tell you this is our practical experience i am sharing with you a very enormously enlarged teeth within 5 days it comes to normal the and you will be surprised the affected teeth is so hard just like wood like you will not be able to press it also that much of huge swelling is there on fifth day it becomes soft and pliable and that's how you can remove the bill without any hesitation there is no need for assistance in first day you may have to put the cannulation sometimes to remove the bill but on fifth day there is a dramatic reduction in the swelling the teeth can be manipulated and let me tell you the animal also over react so much of pain is there try to understand that animal will not allow you to touch the affected teeth okay but fifth day at the very easily you can manipulate and milk the animal okay so that is the difference okay now you see here zero day and fifth day try to make the difference here so much of huge inflamed swelling is there and fifth day you see it has shrunk you can see the wrinkles also on the teeth which will never happen which will never happen let me tell you with any other uh, you know therapeutic protocol and that is what our finding was there and that's why i always insist if you 100% sure allergic mammitis you go for this spray it depends salvotamol is cheaper uh, budenoside is slightly costly budenoside 200 is still costly and then protocol porocart is again still costly depend but it does wonder in case of allergic mammitis let me tell you. here you see just we were discussing isn't it here you see one Two, three. All three teeth are affected. Only one teeth is normal here. You can see after third day, this is good on the side. Two hundred spray. Okay. On third day itself, they have resumed normal uh, physiology. You can see the wrinkles have appeared. They are soft and pliable. Easily the milk can be taken. Here you see, both the teeth are affected. You can see they can. They are so tense. On third day budenoside 200 you see they have almost come to the one third of its inflamed size and very easy to manipulate wrinkles have appeared they can very easily be uh, manipulated 
and you can just melt them, remove them. Now, this I purposefully am uh, you know sharing this slide. This is the complication. When the allergic mammitis case is presented to you, please keep it in mind. A delay in treatment or the treatment which is supposed to be correct one, if it is not done, it can result into sloughing of the teeth. You can see the whole affected teeth from the base itself, it has sloughed off. And this happens in about 90% of the untreated cases of allergic mammitis. And we have reversed the condition uh, in many cases. And the farmers also they kept on you know reacting and telling that sir we have not uh, seen such kind of miraculous results uh, in, uh, earlier also probably if they are uh, old dairy farmers they will also say that earlier events have resulted into total product loss sometimes teeth loss and all but by bringing the animal to our hospital a mod modified therapeutic regimen has saved the animal and uh, the milk production will come to normal in about three to four weeks time. So this is the complication of untreated cases. So conclusion of this allergic mammitis. Early detection, I told you in the very first slide, early detection and early treatment is the key factors in allergic mammitis. And always they are rewarded. If you identify the condition very early, you will say that the condition is likely to be reversed in about three to five days. It depends, okay. but maximum of five days, what we have seen at our point. Educating farmers about the condition. Primary animals, we have identified the incidence is very high. The graded Murga, Murra buffalo, they are uh, more susceptible than any other uh, other uh, breeds of animals. Then the disease occurs in about uh, 10 to 15 days immediately after parturition. All these things, you keep on sharing with the farmers who are in buffalo breeding and buffalo management. They buffalo. Uh, dairy owners, so that they also know that such and such condition exists. You can prepare, you know, different slides and you can uh, make them aware that such and such condition is very risky and you may have to lose the productive animal. And that's why the farmer education is very, very important. And that's why we give a lot of emphasis on exchange. Awareness and knowledge upgradation in the veterinary. So whenever a chance is there, so that's why I was telling you that Dr. Shafi and Dr. Uh, Borikar, uh, they just interacted and they said, so my status is the topic of uh, our training. So would you like to speak on this topic? So then I said, probably my status, so many people will talk about it. Let me talk about this disease, which is a, of a grave concern amongst the buffalo dairy farms. And veterinarians are also facing a lot of difficulty in the field because they are doing at their level best, but the cases they do not respond. And why they do not respond? because our approach is slightly different. And probably, I hope, this uh, my uh, webinar will give focus and it will uh, give additional light on the topic of allergic mammitis and it will be definitely helpful in treating the cases of allergic mammitis. But in the source, our final uh, conclusion, we have tried, as I told you, uh, Salbutamol 100 microgram, we have tried, Budonocyte 200, 100 microgram, we have tried, Budonocyte 200 microgram we have tried, Budonocyte formoterol combination we have tried, but our experience is that Budonocyte 200 microgram spray is much, much superior in bringing back the animal to the production uh, compared to the other treatments. So our recommendation is the Budonocyte 200 microgram spray should be used for in the treatment of allergic mammitis, along with, as I told you, three to five days of antibiotic and histamine. And if you are um, comfortable, you can use even isoflurid also. If you want to avoid isoflurid, you can go for uh, potent anti-inflammatory drug like clonixinamide. So thank you one and all for a, a nice uh, patient hearing. And I hope I could have, I was able to communicate all what I wanted to communicate as far as allergic mammitis is concerned. And Hope this slide was educative to all of you. And I would like to thank uh, Dr. Nitin Markande and his team, which included Dr. Shafi, Dr. Siddiqui, Dr. Borikar, uh, for making this uh, online training happen. And uh, so many veterans are likely to get benefited because of 
three days deliberation on mastitis, which is a burning issue for not only the dairy farmers, for the veterinarians also. And also, I would like to uh, say my sincere thanks to Dr. Nitin Bhatia and his team as a knowledge partner who are contributing a lot in scientific uh, knowledge sharing. And I'm thankful to them also. And the, all the veterinarians, I'm finding how many of them are there. There are about uh, 60, more than 60, 65 uh, participants are there. And they are, <coughs> they are uh, part of this uh, online training. So I'm thankful to them also for patiently. Thank you, Dr. Bhatia and Dr. Shafi. Please take over. Thank you very much, sir, for this uh, nice piece of uh, lecture and a very informative topic uh, as we have received a lot of questions from the studies regarding the thylates and uh, allergic mammites. You have nicely taken this, sir. Thank you very much, sir, for this. Now we will take, sir, a few questions from the participants. Uh, participants can... Please, sir, unmute, sir, unmute, sir. Uh, I should say sorry to Dr. Rajulkar because of the late start, but we are in time or what? Yes, we are, we are in time. Yes, yes. Uh, Dr. Rajulkar's, uh, I think it's also a very important topic and I yes, hope yes, also that topic yes. also will be. Uh, so what? We will take, sir, a few, one, two questions uh, from the participant side. Participants can raise their hands or they can put their question in the chat box so that we can. Uh, one question is there, sir. Uh, what's the product name of this uh, bednocide and salbutamol product which have been used in this? Sir, please unmute, sir. <coughs> ah, salbutamol is available in acetylene spray. Acetylene spray. Sir, so there is uh, one more question. Sir, is it confirmed that any herpes virus etiologies? Though you have, sir, told in no, your lecture that our, no our, our study did not yield herpes virus. Yes, our sir. study did not yield herpes virus. There were some virus-like particles in electro electron study, electron microscopic study, but they were not resembling with herpes virus. So I am not sure whether. Herpes virus is associated with the condition. So, uh, see here, Dr. Shafi. Yes, sir. Please, sir. This is acetylene, which is Asthenia. cheapest, cheapest available. Okay, salvatamol, inhaler, or fixed aer aerosol spray, they call it. Okay. The other one, they call it as budocot. Budocot comes in 100 microgram and 200 microgram potency. And the fourth product, is budonocyte and formoterol combination that is available under the trade name for accord for accord spray sir there is uh, one question did you try it with any pcr i think this is the first as far as di diagnosis is kind of polymer yeah, reaction no, no, good uh, dr pawan uh, we will try to do it. We will try to do it. We didn't do it. That time PCR was not available in our college. So we did not do it. Various isolations. I think there is no more question, sir. On the behalf of Organizing Committee, College of Veterinary Sciences, I am highly thankful to you, sir, for accepting our invitation and delivering a wonderful topic and sharing the experience on this topic that, that is allergic mammitis, a condition which is most commonly seen in buffaloes and a cause of concern to farmers. Sir, I'm uh, uh, highly grateful to you, sir, for sharing this nice topic. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Right. Sir, sir, now we uh, move to next topic. Uh, Dr. Rajul Karsar is here. Most welcome, sir, in this uh, three days online training. Yes. Sir, before uh, uh, moving to uh, the topic, I will just introduce uh, sir. Uh, sir has a lot of uh, 
Dr. S. Rajur Kassar is currently professor and head of veterinary pharmacology, College of Veterinary Sciences, Parbani. Sir has a lot of, a lot of ex teaching experience, more than 24 years, and has a lot of research publications to his credit, 72 research publications in international and national journals, and also a lot of um, uh, extension work in the form of popular articles, more than 300. And Sir has also published three series of uh, 30, 56, and 52 each popular articles in Marathi on subject medicinal plants in animal diseases in agro one paper. Sir has also given a lot of radio and TV talks and has participated in international conference that is Purina Nutrition Forum at St. Louis, USA. And Sir has got a letter of appreciation by Dr. APJ Abdul Kalam, President of, President of India for the research work on herbal plants. Sir has been also awarded with fellowship from Animal Welfare Board, New Delhi. And Sir has also published a book, Marathi book by the PA on the medicinal plants and animal diseases and has been awarded for this work as a first prize as Balaraja by Dr. Narayan Khedkar. First, this is the name of the prize that is Bali Raja, sorry, first prize of Bali Raja, Dr. Narayan Khedkar in 2005. So most welcome, sir, and <coughs> we are very fortunate enough that sir is with us and he is uh, as a pharmacology expert. We have given a topic choice of antibiotics in case of mastitis. As this is a great concern nowadays, we are, we are seeing a lot of treatment failures as there is a lot of antibiotic resistance which is emerging in the microorganism. So most welcome, sir, and you can continue, sir. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Trohi. Uh, I, good evening to all the doctors, all the participants. I'll share my presentation. Uh, just a minute, please. Uh, is it visible, doctor? Yes, sir. Please continue, sir. Yeah. So, uh, just a minute, please. So good evening, everybody. And uh, today's my topic particularly is uh, related with the antibiotics and uh, moreover, it's a rational use. Uh, I will again, uh, just for a minute, I will just minimize these things. So the choice of antibiotics and their rational use in mastitis is a topic uh, which is assigned to me by the organizing committee. Uh, first of all, I thank all the organizing committee for giving me chance to be with you all. So this is uh, the topic. Myself, Dr. Sudhir Rajurkar, I'm professor and head at Veterinary Pharmacology and Toxicology, College of Veterinary Animal Sciences, Parbani. So the uh, uh, first one or two, two to three sites will be of basic, that is the main cause because all are veterinarians here and everybody knows uh, these things that is the main cause for the mastitis uh, that may be a physical, maybe be infectious because of the bacterial or fungal. And just now Dr. Kasradikar has also uh, given his lecture regarding the allergic uh, type of uh, mastitis. So under the physical, maybe a physical injury to the memory region 
and again most commonly as a as a field veterinarian so i'm talking now this lecture will be in uh, from the point of field veterinarians so the poor hygienic conditions or trauma this may cause the physical injury at the trauma may cause physical injury and may lead to the mastitis cases as far as the bacterial is concerned we all we always know that we are using antibiotics since many years and in this lecture we will have to see we are going to see so what type of antibiotics which are commonly used how can we reduce <coughs> the use of this because nowadays we are facing a lot of problems regarding the antimicrobial resistance and the next cause of mastitis may be fungus that is the aspergillus we know that the aspergillus is the uh, main uh, fungal uh, fungus that is responsible for this no doubt uh, trichosperma is also there and the allergic which uh, just now we have seen the, these things uh, as far as possible as i, I again repeat that we are uh, i am focusing this from the point of field veterinarians so we all know that uh, prevention is better than cure and as far as possible we'll have to prevent the mastitis because no doubt a uh, lot of complications may occur it will be a very costlier for the farmer and of course uh, painful for the animal so better is to prevent and of course there are few uh, tips which are very common that is just to create a clean environment prevent stress to animal so stress pay environment to animals is most important because we know that stress leads to uh, dip, uh, reduction in immunity and the reduced immunity causes the disease conditions maybe any any disease whatever the solids are there uh, whatever the dirt is there around it clean it before milking examine the udder regularly use proven effective pre milking tip drips and use a uh, Uh, towels paper towels reusable cloth to clean the dry so these are the most common and uh, we veterinarians tell these tip, tips to farmer so these are the tip now uh, if we see the normal prescription of a field veterinarian maybe anyone normally he, whenever the case of uh, mastitis is there we prescribe antibiotic for uh, systemic use intramuscular use or at the same time some anti sorry some intramammary infusions so these antibiotics are used at the same time because in mastitis there is inflammation there is um, fibrosis we prescribe anti inflammatory and with the as a support you and uh, along with this antibiotics and anti inflammatory we prescribe anti histaminic that is anti allergic so this is the most common pre uh, prescription of a common veterinarian antibiotic anti inflammatory and, uh, and allergic anti allergic that is anti histaminics so as far as antibiotics are there so we are using different types of antibiotics since beginning we are using uh, simple antibiotics nowadays to a third generation fourth generation antibiotics so which antibiotic is to be used second is the dose of antibiotics and third is duration for how much days we should use no doubt the uh, as uh, in field we may uh, we don't get uh, facilities to specific to use the specific antibiotic but it is must so as far as antibiotics are concerned let's see there is there are different types of antibiotics so classification of antibiotics which is based on their uh, structure their uh, spectrum and there are different types of uh, uh, and drugs comes under this so first is the beta lactam beta lactam of course will go in detail for each of this and of course not in much detail but few lines about each of this so there are seven basically seven types of antibiotics that is number one is beta lactam antibiotics second is aminoglycoside type of antibiotic tetracyclines are there chloramphenicols are there macrolid antibiotics lincosamide antibiotics and quinolones and furoquinolones amongst these we commonly use beta lactam so what is the reason that we'll go in detail so beta lactam uh, basically they are the narrow spectrum antibiotics prior to beta lactams there were non beta lactam antibiotics but they have some specific disadvantages we'll see in that also 
So beta lactam antibiotics are the bactericidal. So they kill the bacteria, but they are narrow spectrum. And the, why they are classified as beta lactam? Because they contain a beta lactam ring. The, they are bactericidal. They inhibit the cell wall synthesis of a bacteria. So this there will be a lysis of cell wall leading to the death of bacteria. And the first antibiotics that is discovered is the penicillin and which is same that comes under the beta lactam. So penicillin, cephalosporins, and nowadays we are using um, next generation, next generation like uh, antibiotics. But the most common thing uh, or the most uh, problematic thing in that, in this beta lactam is, there are some bacteria which have a beta lactamase enzyme that they can synthesize the beta lactamase and this causes inhibition of this beta lactam or they develop or they are resistant to beta lactam antibiotics. So penis, uh, penicillins or cephalosporins or the next generation antibiotics, there are, uh, there are certain bacteria which are naturally resistant to this beta lactam antibiotics. So we'll go in detail also. So second type of antibiotic is aminoglycosides. It is also bactericidal and this contains amino sugar. And this sugar is with a linkage of glycosidic uh, linkage and the mechanism of action of aminoglycoside is they inhibit the protein synthesis of the bacteria. So because of this also, there is no protein for available for their, their body requirement and this leads to the death of bacteria. So that is the bactericidal inaction. Aminoglycoside type of antibiotics are always uh, uh, Basically, they are narrow spectrum antibiotics like streptomycin. But uh, the scientists, the pharmacists, the chemists, they work on this and develop some or and induce some changes by substituting some locations in a benzene ring. And they have developed extended spectrum uh, aminoglycoside um, antibiotics that is neomycin, primycin, canamycin. Also, this further change into a broad spectrum antibiotics, that is gentamicin, tobramycin, amicacin. So uh, the beta lactam, they are only narrow spectrum. Whereas the aminoglycoside, we get it in a narrow spectrum, extended spectrum and broad spectrum. Whereas the third one, that is this tetracyclines, they are bacteriostatic and they are uh, with the broad spectrum. Tetracycline, we get, uh, there are two sources for the tetracycline, natural, are the streptomyces stores, that is the oxytetracycline and chlorotetracycline are the naturally uh, prepared or they are from streptomyces only. Whereas the synthetic, that is tetracycline, methacycline, doxycycline, roll tetracycline, these are the synthetic one which are prepared in a laboratory. The third type of, uh, oh, sorry, the fourth type of uh, uh, antibiotic is a chlorine phenicol, which we commonly use. It's broad, it is a broad spectrum antibiotic Chlorine, chlorine phenicol, fluorine chlorine, uh, fluorine phenicol, then thiamine phenicol, these are the examples of this. The macrolide antibiotics, they are uh, the lactone rings to which one or more deoxy sugar is attached. So these are the basic uh, uh, type of antibiotics and it is from the point of pharmacologists. So they, their structure is a lactone ring and it is attached with one or more deoxy sugar. And with this attachment, with changes in these attachments, the pharmacist or the chemist can develop a new antibiotic. So uh, the example of macrolid is erythromycin, spiramycin, tylosine. The next uh, sixth one is a lincosamide. And this lincosamide is closely related to the macrolid type of antibiotics by just some changes in the structure, uh, the uh, new class that is lincosamide is developed. So lincomycin, clindamycin, these are the antibiotics. And quinolones and fluoroquinolones are the anti, no doubt they are antibacterial, antibiotic. Uh, the nalidixic acid, oxalinic acid, ciprofloxacin, norfloxacin, endrofloxacin. Just few years back, uh, maybe uh, 15, 20 years back, these cipro, nor, and uh, endrofloxacin uh, introduced in the market. Amongst this, the Beta lactam based antibiotics like penicillin, its derivatives like cephalosporin, these are approved by US FDA uh, for its use in dairy cattle. Of course, they are also uh, then uh, used, uh, uh, approved by Indian FDA also. Basically, they were used in a treatment of foot rot, mustatis in 
uh, lactating and dry cows also it is in dry cows also it can be used metritis and respiratory distress so this is as the first was uh, the first beta lactam antibiotic that is the penicillin was uh, uh, mentioned in the usp that is united states pharmacopeia and then it is again registered in uh, mostly all the countries pharmacopeia but the first was uh, registered under the us pharmacopeia now if we see the different types of antibiotics we have seen about seven classes of antibiotics if we see these different types of antibiotics most of the antibiotics or the many of antibiotics they are excreted or they are secreted in milk but as compared with all penicillin cephalosporin erythromycin are considered as a safe and based on this we come we use we recommend beta lactam antibiotics in treatment of mastitis so because they contains a beta lactam ring in their molecular structure so the beta lactam antibiotics are comparatively safe than others and that's why the beta lactam antibiotics are commonly used in treatment of mastitis cases so prior to beta lactam there were some antibiotics and that they were non beta lactam so and uh, this is a most common or common alternative to penicillins that is vancomycin and it in the first it was first approved in you uh, for the, its use in 1958 but uh, then beta lactams were observed to be a uh, cheaper less toxic and um, they are uh, observed to be better in their efficacy than the non beta lactam and that's why beta lactam antibiotics are considered as a uh, comparatively safe and recommended for use in the treatment of mastitis so we are uh, basically the today uh, topic for my today's lecture is the rational use because nowadays we are uh, reading and we are observing on even on televisions that Uh, the development of bacterial resistance to these antibiotics is very common and this resistance development use of irrational use of this antibiotics leading to the development not only development of resistance but there is development of one uh, a bacteria or a organism that is called a superbug which is not responding to any antibiotics or this is a uh, we can say this is a sort of uh, 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 hospital organism where different types of organ antibiotics are used and this is leading to a development of resistance to more than uh, or number of uh, antibiotics and this is getting developed and that is called as superbug so uh, we will have to use the antibiotic in a rational way so the appropriate use of the antibiotic as per the clinical need of the patient the use of antibiotics only when the patient is in need and in a doses which are suitable which are recommended and which are adequate and for a adequate period of time must be followed uh, under the rational use so under the national rational use we are using a, a particular antibiotic which is more effective than others that is we have we know that we can perform culture sensitivity test at even at a uh, uh, taluka level or some dispensary level and we can select the antibiotic for the specific type of bacteria and use that only in appropriate clinical needs and whenever because uh, i i can give one example uh, particular this is not related with veterinary but uh, a survey was conducted in delhi uh, that they have uh, they have collected the prescriptions of different patients and they observed that normally doctor prescribes about seven drugs in one prescription about seven this is the average out of these seven three of these drug are of no use in that particular disease condition remaining four are the common as antibiotics anti inflammatory analgesic or uh, sorry anti histaminics they are very common and along with this as a corrective some b complex or type of uh, antacids types of compounds are given but unnecessary we are or unnecessary we are prescribing three more drugs which are of no use in that particular condition second whatever the antibiotics which are used in that condition 
it must be tested for that particular disease condition at least in a particular area a particular uh, city of this uh, city or particular state or particular geographic area we must test whether this particular antibiotic is showing its higher efficacy or not and then only we will have to select that but we don't care about that at least few of us don't care of care uh, we don't take care of this but this is not advised so under the rational use we'll have to use a selective antibiotic in a proper dose only and whenever it is in need of the patient so rational use of drug means a prescribe uh, appropriate drug in correct dose over an adequate period so there are three terms appropriate drug correct dose and adequate period so these are the most common from the point of doctor and from the point of patient from the point of owner lowest cost so lowest cost is also there so we'll have to avoid adverse effects or irrational use of antibiotics on patient we'll have to avoid emergence of antibiotic resistance and because of that only we are using it uh, rationally and above uh, avoid unnecessary increase in the cost of healthcare so just to avoid these we are here to see what are the rational what is the rational way uh, uh, to use antibiotic so what are the benefits no doubt rational medicines use strategy enhances the effective safe and cost effectiveness so effective safe and cost effectiveness these are the basic benefits of the rational use of antibiotics and uh, we can preserve the effectiveness of antimicrobials because uh, we all know that if we use a particular antibiotics for a long duration it will develop resistance so we'll have to you preserve the effectiveness of antimicrobials and contribute to good health outcomes so this is the most important or these are the benefits and for this what we can do so for this what we can do is amps a is avoid antibiotics wherever possible wherever possible we will have to avoid antibiotics no doubt there are cases where we must use antibiotics but in that case we will have to minimize minimize the use means it is not below the therapeutic dose level minimize means uh, adequate one so these are the two terms as far as the uh, antibiotics are concerned we can uh, avoid the use of antibiotics we can minimize the use of antibiotics but there is one more uh, aspect that is potential there are certain drugs there are certain safe drugs there are certain natural drugs natural things for example herbs because i am a person working on herbal medicine since long and there are certain herbals uh, herbal therapeutic tools which can potentiate the efficacy of antibiotic so if we can potentiate the efficacy definitely this will be helpful to minimize the use to reduce the dose to reduce the uh, duration of treatment and at the same time this will save the cost of our owner owner of the patient so this is again a very important that is potentiation of the antibiotic which we are using and fourth one supportive therapy so along with antibiotics can we use certain drugs can we use certain uh, medicines which will help or which will boost uh, the efficacy of antibiotics which will potentiate the efficacy of antibiotic at the same time which will re reduce the other effect other side effects of antibiotics so supportive therapy because see i am a pharmacologist and I, i know so when we teach student that uh, prescription writing there is always there are always a basic drug adjuvant and corrective so since ancient since the origin of prescription the three types of drugs are used one is a basic drug that is the main drug which is to be used for example antibiotics second is adjuvant adjuvant means a drug which will boost which will improve the efficacy of the basic one and third one is corrective because this corrective is essential because see this above drug may be basic or adjuvant may have some side effects and just to correct these side effects we will have to use the correctives and then of course the fourth one is a vehicle and nowadays we are getting a ready made drugs 
so we are not um, what we call is we are not using the prepared drug at a hospital we are using the ready made so vehicle uh, is only used to administer the drug so at the time of administration we we'll, we recommend that crush the uh, bolus add uh, water to it and then drench so like that vehicle is used but the basic amps avoid antibiotics minimize the use of antibiotics potentiate the antibiotics and supportive therapy along with the antibiotics these four things are the basic uh, power supply amps so you many of you must have heard one uh, word that is smps that is smps is a part which is used in computer and that is nothing but a, a power supply to computer it's a hardware which supply power to the computer and here amps these are the things which will supply power to our use of antibiotic to our rational use of antibiotic so amps is most important we'll see what avoid the antibiotics so in subclinical cases we can minimize or we can avoid antibiotics only by maintaining the hygienic conditions we can prevent the sub even the subclinical antibiotic um, subclinical mastitis we can improve the immunity of the animals by particular uh, using some herbs even that is use of antibacterial alternative therapy also we can use during subclinical mastitis but even prior to subclinical mastitis if we maintain hygiene in our cattle shed this will not lead to subclinical mastitis and this subclinical mastitis will not convert to clinical mastitis so this is more important if we maintain the hygiene at the same time if we try to improve the immunity of animal so this will make the animal comparative resistant to the bacterial infection or to the any type of infection so improve the immunity of animal so for improving the immunity of animal we can use certain uh, immunostimulant herbs at the same time we can keep the uh, animal stress free even a stress can lead to uh, immuno immuno compromisation so we can keep the animal stress free and thus we can improve the immunity of animal so uh, use of antibacterial alternate therapy so alternative therapy we this see these three plants that is curcuma longa tragas tradax procumbens and vitex nigundo these are very common plants curcuma longa that is nothing but a turmeric so this turmeric we can use because since ancient period we are using turmeric as a treatment for infection even when there is some wound we apply turmeric we apply uh, uh, this turmeric powder so use of this oral through uh, through oral route this can improve the immunity immunity uh, status of the animal and also this can prevent the infection if we give it orally at the same time even if we can prepare some wash uh, some we can put some uh, turmeric in water and uh, we can use this water, uh, water as a tip dip for the animal so this will prevent the chances of subclinical mastitis also the chances of conversion of subclinical mastitis to clinical mastitis so this curcuma longa that is turmeric can be used uh, in a subclinical or non clinical cases this is a most common plant that is tradax procumbens this uh, in marathi it is called as tantani or it is also called as jakham jodi so wound healer the meaning of jakham jodi is wound healer so wound healing uh, is the our uh, basic uh, target so in uh, the wound healing means what wound healing means anti infective so this tradax procumbens can heal the uh, wound can heal the affection can heal the infection so tradax procumbens use is also recommended so we can crush this tradax procumbens we can use the uh, juice of this as a tip dip or even we can give it orally whereas the third one that is the vitex nigundo this is the most commonly used analgesic anti inflammatory plant so whenever there is some joint pains in our uh, in case of our um, old uh, person in our house so we apply some potis of this vitex uh, uh, nigundo that is called as nirgudi so this this is the most commonly used plant uh, as a an anti inflammatory analgesic and this can be used as a external for local application over the order so whenever there is subclinical mastitis we can use the curcuma we can use the tradax and we can use this vitex so whatever the initiation of uh, the inflammation is there it will be 
cured immediately without going for the antibiotics so of course use of antibiotics is must in mastitis case but the doctor the person who is treating the animal will take will have to take the care of this uh, particular thing whether to use the antibiotic and if if you want to use what should be the dose and duration of antibiotic so with this uh, prevention that is avoid antibiotics use we can go for the next that is amps the minimize the use of antibiotic how can we minimize this because when there is a mastitis we'll have to use the antibiotic we can use the you can minimize the use just by a simple test that is culture sensitive sensitivity test go for the cst test the milk sample for the cst test and based on the result obtained from the uh, laboratory select the antibiotics so instead of using two three antibiotics at a time go for the specific antibiotic so this is by uh, culture sensitive test and when you are using a specific antibiotic we can we have the recommendations by the manufacturer that this is the dose of the compound this dose should be given for this much period so only by reading that we can go for the specific antibiotic specific schedule specific, specific period of the uh, treatment so of course we are we all are veterinarians and we know uh, what should be the dose of the particular antibiotic but even after that we should follow the instructions which are given by the manufacturer which are already printed on the label of that particular product so we we'll, we can minimize the use of antibiotics just by a simple way of culture sensitivity test then the potentiation so for potentiation i i i have uh, uh mention a specific term that is bio enhancers there are and here i will talk about some medicinal plants which acts as a bio enhancer and these are proven one so these are not uh, the only the text references they are proven one and these bio enhancers can enhance the efficacy of antibiotic which are going to use so bio enhancers are the uh, this is the most appropriate approach to improve the bioavailability of a basic drug here we are going to use uh, we are using antibiotic and to increase the bioavailability of antibiotic to improve the efficacy of antibiotic we can use some herbal bio enhancers here i am mentioning only two types of bio enhancers which are most common and this is number one piper longum so in marathi it is called as pimpli lendi pimpli and this is a piper longum fruit this fruit it has now this uh, the uh, i am mentioning here i am giving two uh, references piper longum and piper nigrum both the piper longum and piper uh, i have the uh, research data when it is used in treatment of tuberculosis because we know that the, to treat the tuberculosis we need a long duration maybe few years also and this during this few years treatment so uh, the most commonly used drug is rifampicin and isoniazid so they have their side effects so so as to minimize the side effects of this drug these antibiotics i'm we can use uh, the scientist has used piper longum and piper uh, piper nigrum longum and nigrum and it is observed that we can reduce the dose of rifampicin by 30% so whatever the dose they are giving only 70% of that dose can be given to the patient so we have minimized the dose by using bio enhancers like piper longum and second is piper nigrum so these are the two plants which will increase the efficacy of our antibiotics so here our target is rational use under rational use potentiation so here bio enhancers can be used to potentiate to increase the efficacy to bio enhance the efficacy of antibiotics now the third one is the support you uh, the last one ampes so yes is support support again as i i am working on uh, uh, herbal medicines is long so i am taking help of this only uh, in my presentation also so support with herbs so we can improve the immunity we can use some anti infective agents so as to improve the immunity of the drug there are the three drugs three drugs now you have a hard is in last uh, since last one and a half year we are uh, continuously getting bombarded with immunity booster immunity booster and every company 
is bring uh, is launching their product with tinospora cordifolia that is goodwill so on every day we have we are uh, we have some advertisement on our television that with the uh, giloe goodwill or tinospora we can improve the immunity no doubt osimum sanctum that is tulsi and vidania somnifera that is ashwagandha these are the three basic herbs which are used to improve the immunity of uh, individual of a patient this is the plant vidania somnifera it is found everywhere uh, even uh, in city also and even in rural area in rural area it is called as kamuni or dhor kamuni in marathi and because vidania is ashwagandha and this is most commonly used plant to boost the immunity it is antioxidant in nature it improves the immunity of animal or human and it is even uh, there are about 150 isolates which are seen in uh, vidania within in somniferin there are 150 about 150 isolates so we can use this vidania somnifera to boost the immunity second is osimum sanctum is the most common plant which is in our um, area or it is uh, in every house it is there that is the tulsi it's a holy plant and this can and of course this is anti bacterial anti fungal and immunity booster antioxidant in nature so this is a tulsi you can see the seeds of tulsi leaves of tulsi seeds are better than the leaves and of course we can use the leaves also so these and tinospora cordifolia goodwill giloe this is the plant so uh, every uh, immunity booster uh, preparation contains this uh, giloe or goodwill so this these are the plants which can be used to improve the immunity so under this supportive treatment we are we are going for two types of treatments number one is to improve the immunity and number two anti infective uh, plant sources which can be used along with the antibiotic so that these will boost the efficacy of the antibiotics so this anti infective again the same plants curcuma longa and tridax procumbens so this is the tridax procumbens and uh, so yeah so this is uh, regarding my uh, 45 minutes of lecture so if anybody have any question can uh, go for this thank you very much sir participants are requested to ask the questions they can put a question in the chat box or they can raise their hand and unmute their mic and ask the question all those who are interested in asking the question can raise their hands or else put it on the q and a box so one question is there what dose of bio enhancer or immuno booster should be given to the animal yeah uh, so as far as the large animals are concerned particularly when uh, we are, in today's topic we are talking about the muscatus and particularly large animal so uh, this uh, piper longum and piper nigrum they are given at the dose rate of 300 to 500 mg per kg body weight so this we have proven 300 to 500 mg per kg orally arsh is asking some question quantity to you to be used in treatment of uh, bio boosters uh, it is almost same question the yeah those they are asking i think about doses yeah. <clears throat> anyone from the participant side any question so i think there is no more question sir okay. so on the behalf of organizing committee 
we are highly thankful to you sir for this insightful lecture of rational use of antibiotics thank you very much sir thank you thank you to all the team uh, respected markande sir is there thank you sir uh, dr kasarikar also was here uh, and thankful to all of you to the uh, panelist and even the uh, media partner or this uh, dr <coughs> bhatia sir and all these things so all the uh, participants also thank you sir thank you thank you very much sir now i request uh, associate dean of our college dr markande sir for the concluding remarks of this three days online training program thank you thank you dr shafi yes, it is a matter of great pleasure for we all that the three days technical webinar on bovine mastitis we have successfully completed today as a matter of fact it was the demand of the participants and the field veterinarians that we are more interested to have a lecture series on mastitis so the genesis of this particular webinar is on demand basis i requested dr bhatia sir regarding this particular topic and immediately it was accepted by him for virtual type of platform and also suggested many things regarding planning of this particular webinar we are very much thankful that very senior and experts from the field of medicine and pharmacology they have participated this lecture series and they have also satisfied the professional vets regarding their questions friends control on mastitis is going on since last many years we are trying to reduce the incidence of mastitis but still after parturition many animals are suffering from mastitis it is sir, only yeah. because of mixed type of infection kind of sir sorry to be disturbing uh, i'll request all the participants to stay back for a short duration till markande sir finishes and then we'll like to listen you all for your feedback please right sorry, sir. actually i personally feel that preventive measures are more important and these preventive measures are possible before parturition of cows and buffaloes when we go for improving the immunity of the animals before parturition now the days have changed and we have many herbal type of immunity boosters with us those are cheap also but using such a type of immuno modulators boosters before parturition will definitely help in reducing the incidence i have experienced many cases of mastitis in my life and i realized that it is a very painful type of thing for entire dairy owners family to treat the case of mastitis long term therapy huge expenditure and reduction in the milk yield these type of problems for a rural poor are very much stressful we have to exert well to control on subclinical mastitis and subclinical endometritis because they are the best friends of each other i recollect that intas has taken initiative for one team lecture series and during different type of conferences they have brought about literature only on one theme topics 
one such mastitis booklet is available with the intas and that is only for the field veterinarians mastitis metritis cascade that was my topic of contribution friends it is not a part to present that which we did earlier but it is a part what we want to achieve what we want to extend our knowledge for control of the mastitis every time our experience we should contribute through publications successful approaches are very much important and i recollect one such research publication was regularly publishing horse sense column so if anything which clicks for the mastitis even at the field level that will be useful for we all so i request you all to be a part of control campaign on mastitis and contribute your experiences our seniors our experts they have they have given us the idea how to attain a case of mastitis but once you succeed in attempting the case of mastitis it is your bound and duty to contribute your experience to the others with such a type of approach definitely we will be able to limit this type of infection and we will be able to increase the bill killed productivity that is the dream of our honorable prime minister boosting farmers income during bharat ka amrutotsav atmanirbharta all these things are related only with the point of key point of mastitis and i realize the success of the webinar with these type of objectives i am thankful to all the experts on behalf of the institute i am thankful to intas for providing such a type of a nice platform and now all these presentations will be available on youtube as a regular practice intas is also serving the professional veterinarians through e compendium so everything will be available for you post webinar contributions from your side are also expected to the organizer of this particular program i am thankful to the participants they have contributed by joining this particular program and they will extend this type of technical activity to their friends and also to their colleagues thank you thank you very much sir for everyone for successful completion of this particular event thank you thank you dr tohit thank you dr mf siddiqui and thank you department of medicine thank you very much thank you dr uh, bhatias thank you very much sir for your guidance and concluding remarks now we will take a few feedbacks from the participant side for improvements of the future trainings so participants are requested to give their feedback they can raise can their raise your hand hands yes and unmute their mic and yeah yoginder mr yoginder meena. meena is there please unmute your mic and you can even share your video if you want or unmute and speak mr meena please unmute your mic yeah mr suresh you have you have unmuted please go on hello sir can you hear me yeah yes yes please, please uh, sir uh, good evening good evening it was a very fantastic program but uh, as you know uh, we are working in the office hours so many of us have not attended the program 
although i was recording the program <laughs> on my mobile but even then i would like to uh, get a recording uh, do, uh, do you sharing it on youtube or somewhere sir it is already parallel on youtube we'll share you the link within the next 2 minutes thank you already so there much, thank you so much thank and you and it so will much. stay there always okay sir okay sir have a nice test bye thank you thank you very much so mr yogendra meena you can unmute your mic and give your feedback डॉक्टर जोगिंदर टू स्पीक और एनी वन मोर इंटरेस्टेड इन स्पीकिंग आउट वी रिक्वेस्ट योर फीडबैक good or bad for improvement for betterment all options open be expressive be open please yeah participants are requested to give their feedback so that uh, their feedback can be taken positively for future trainings as uh, earlier during the covid time most of the people they were sitting at the home and enjoying these trainings but now this due to busy schedule office hours we are also realizing that time should be now modified uh, for this training it should be beyond the office hours so we will take these things in okay. for due care in future trainings so any other participant they can give their positive feedbacks if there is no positive feedback uh, if there is no feedback yeah okay sorry sir if there is no feedback we will move on to the vote of thanks i will request dr m f siddiqui sir for the vote of thanks thank you very much dr shafi sir uh, today we are at the verge of the end of this uh, three day training program so i am very much thankful first of all to our uh, respected honorable vice chancellor sir dr am patrukar sir who has given the permission for the organization of this uh, training program thank you very much sir and i am also thankful to the patrons of uh, our university mapsu that's more namely dr sv upadhyay sir dean and di mapsu nagpur then dr nv kurkure sir director of research dr eu bikane sir director of extension for providing the a uh, necessary facilities and the giving the necessary permissions and all the support thank you very much so most importantly i am thankful to the respected dr n m markande sir associate dean college of veterinary and animal sciences parbani who is the main force behind the organization of such type of events at the parbani veterinary college and i am also thankful for the sir for giving the today sir has given the very much valuable guidance which will be very much helpful for us also and for the participant also so thank you very much sir so most importantly i am thankful to the all the speakers namely the dr bansal sir dr samad sir dr ujwal day sir dr punya murthy sir dr sr rajurkar sir and dr vivek kasradikar sir thank you very much to the all the speakers for sparing their valuable time and guiding to the participants and all of us and the most importantly i am thankful to the knowledge partner and the the association sir has already mentioned and just like the intas pharmaceutical limited dr nitin bhatia sir and dr amanjot singh sir and their whole team for providing the platform for the organization of this event so i am wholeheartedly on behalf of the college of veterinary animal sciences i am thankful to the intas pharmaceutical limited and their all team at last i am very much thankful to the all the participants who will be present for this uh, three days training program so thank you very much to all of them so on behalf of the the today's president and the associate dean i will convey that this program is over if any announcement please bhatia sir
if any announcement is there yeah hello sidgi hello sir ah uh, i don't have an announcement to make i just have a commitment to make that we are organizing our best in terms of uh, selecting a clinical topic and bringing it to you and we shall be doing it again and again with college of veterinary science but yeah till dr markande sir allows us to do that so and please don't worry the recorded line is already available you can the link is already put on the chat box you can uh, subscribe yourself to the webwit channel of intas the recorded link is already there this li- this link is also currently going live there although we have a inner capacity which is good so we are not uh, distributed the same to externally but after this it is available there and please don't worry about compendium certificates all will reach you on email it is only going to take us a small amount of time to do so <coughs> so we shall ensure all the same don't uh, you don't need to remind us we'll do it so that's all from our end thank you all for being a participant for being interactive and in case we had any lacunas we are sorry for the same you can communicate back to us on webwet at the rate intas pharma in case you have any feedbacks which was left attended unattended which you are receiving the email currently for the last 3 days and it was nice being with you all nice learning with you all and good day to all of you and thank you all very happy diwali to all participants in tas fraternity and also kovas uh, parbani yeah happy diwali to the entire veterinary community college of veterinary science parbani and of course intas as is sir rightly said and on the entire entire crew out here thank you thank you all thank you all thank you very much thank you very much thank you thank you, thank you dr sidiki thank you dr sapi and happy diwali to you also